We are glad that you could join us for our virtual event, Welcome to Roanoke, Precision Biomedical Technology. My name is AJ Malott, and I am here with Heather Decker and Matt Ferris. Heather is my business partner and co-founder. Matt is one of our closest colleagues, and he will be responsible for moderating the event tonight. Why don't you both tell the attendees hello? Hello. Hello and welcome. For this event, we will be taking you on a virtual tour of our manufacturing facility, and um, we will showcase some of the exciting equipment we utilize to manufacture our products and verify the quality of our products. We have a lot of fun and are proud of the work we do here at Ronoc. Matt, why don't you tell the audience how they can interact with us during the tour? Yeah, thanks, AJ. To allow all of our participants to focus on the video tour, please note that your mics have been muted. As we proceed through the tour, we encourage you to submit questions using the Q&A widget on the bottom panel in Zoom. We'll be cataloging your submitted questions during the tour. We will do our absolute best to address as many questions as possible during our live Q&A session following that tour. Now, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the tour. It is our absolute pleasure to welcome you to Roanoke. see how it works. Hello. Hello. Welcome to Ronoc. We're delighted that you could join us today. My name is AJ Malat and I am the Chief Executive Officer and this I'm, is... I'm Heather Decker. I am Chief Technology Officer here at Ronoc. And today we're going to take you on a tour of the facility we've been building for the last almost six months. But before we get into that, we want to tell you a little bit about Ronoc and why we founded that. So Heather, why don't you tell the audience why we founded Roanoke in the first place? Sure thing, AJ. AJ and I are scientists at heart and we want to be able to use that, our scientific knowledge in order to help others. We do this for, just with our unique backgrounds. AJ and I have known each other for well over a decade at this point. My background is in microscopy, so the use of microscopes in order to view things. And I have this unique skill in order to be able to view lots of different types of materials. And that's actually how I first met AJ when he was doing his graduate work, AJ. Yes, as I was working on my PhD in bioengineering, Heather and I spent a lot of time together uh, solving different problems of imaging cells. And so my PhD really focused on different ways to manipulate cells from outside and inside of the cell wall. Um, I would say uh, we did a lot of uh, problem solving together uh, on various things and uh, that then led to a fruitful collaboration over the years as I went on from there. I focused in tissue engineering and then uh, in 2019 we were able to found Roanoke with this idea, as Heather said, of using science to help others. So let's show you a little bit about how our lab can actually do that. So if you want to come right this way. Welcome to Falcon Lab. This is the hub of our facility. This is where all the research and development and manufacturing of our particular product, the T-Block, is done. AJ, why don't you tell us a little bit about our T-Block? Sure. Thank you, Heather. So the T-Block, also known as a tissue block, is the main product that we manufacture here at Rodon. And what the tissue block is, is a special 3D matrix in which cells can grow. Now, what's really unique about that is with our product, we allow cells to grow in 3D just like they would in the body. And this is more efficient than growing cells using today's traditional methods where cells are grown in, in 2D on plastic. Because we're growing cells in 3D, we get a much more efficient yield. It saves time, it saves money, uh, and it reduces the number of consumables that are needed to produce cells. So, Heather, why don't you now show our guests maybe how you do this? Sure thing. So as AJ mentioned before, traditionally cells have been grown in 2D, culture class very similar to this one. But since ours are grown in 3D, we actually need to print in three dimensions the particular microstructure that we block that we use in our blocks in order to enable those cells to grow. We use actually 3D printers, which are here in this hood behind us. Uh, we have two of them in order to make sure we can keep production going in full to the field and just make sure if we have any downtime, we're actually not limited with production. They're kept in this hood in order to keep them under as sterile conditions as humanly possible. We don't want any contamination um, to be growing inside our product. 
And here is a video on actually how the printing process is done. Let's now take a look at how Ronak prints their T blocks. Step one is placing the build platform into the printer. Step two is adding the reagents to the printer that the T blocks will be made from. Step three is lowering the build platform into the reagents to begin the print process. Step four is sequentially printing to build the 3D T block structure. Step five is to complete that printing process and remove the resulting T blocks from the reagents. Step six is removing T blocks from the build platform and placing them in packaging to move on to quality control. Well, we hope you enjoyed that process of the printing the T blocks. AJ, why don't you tell us a little bit about the R&D process with using T blocks? Sure, that's a good uh, place to start. So when it comes to T blocks, Heather showed you how she prints this really intricate structure. But the really cool thing is we can actually use a variety of different hydrogels and materials to tailor different parameters of the actual block itself. So if we want to make the block more stiff or we want to make it more elastic, we can. Uh, if we want to introduce growth factors that the cells like, we can really tailor the block to any environment for any cell type. And that's what our R&D really focuses on is doing research on different permutations of the block that are going to be most beneficial for specific cell lines. So for example, what a bone cell needs is going to be quite different than what a kidney cell needs or say a neuron. And as we do all that, and as we make all these new blocks, we are actually able to use what's over here. Uh, these are called incubators and we grow the cells in our block in an environment that is physiologically relevant. So inside of these two incubators, the temperature is set at 37 degrees, 5% uh, CO2 is pumped in, and one of the wonderful benefits we have by the cells are growing in our blocks in these environments is that we can actually monitor them in real time thanks to SOING's uh, new cell site, which is a environmental microscope where you can actually monitor cells as they're growing in a uh, culture vessel uh, over time. One of the really good things about this particular product is that you can actually hold up to six plates at one time. So we can actually run six different experiments in parallel, which is very, very critical when we're expanding the different types of cell lines that are useful in our blocks. Because not every single cell line is the same and actually must be treated very differently. And we need to understand those conditions. So AJ, we'll talk a little bit about how our two blocks can be used to exponentially expand cells. What other things can they be used for? Great question. So the blocks actually have more features than just growing cells. And one of that is the unique geometry that we built into the macro structure. So our blocks actually look like these jigsaw puzzle pieces that fit together. And the reason that is so interesting is because of the fact I can grow bone cells in one T-block and culture cartilage cells in another T-block and join them together to have them start interacting with each other to form an interface. This is similar to how different joints in your body grow. For example, when you have a bone and a cartilage pad on your knee that wears over over time, we can actually look at different ways in which those surfaces come together. And so that's one of the important features of the T-box. In addition to that, we can also control what way or what direction the cells grow over time, say if we want to form a tissue. For example, maybe we want to put blocks together where we form more of a polygon shape for making some type of simulation of an organ. Or maybe we want to connect the blocks in a linear fashion to make a tube, say for uh, different types of blood vessels or something related to neuronal tissues. So these are some of the advantages and features of the blocks. One other thing that the blocks enable us to do is actually harvest biologics. So cells when grown in culture generate a lot of their own material that we refer to as biologics. This is usually extracellular matrix, for example, or vesicles that can be used in a variety of different ways through personalized medicine. For example, vaccines. This is one of the very popular ways to make vaccines. And because we're increasing the number of cells that were within the block, we're just increasing the number harvestal biologics that can be used later down the line for other different processes. So now we're going to take you over to Archimedes lab so we can show you how we actually image more of our products. And welcome to our Archimedes lab. 
This is a combination of our R&D print facility and our imaging core. So over here on the left are our R&D bio 3D printers. This particular guy right here um, is Luminex. You may look very familiar. He is the same printer that's in the manufacturing hood over there. We have one here in order to do different types of build testing, whether it's different materials or different microstructures or even macrostructures. I want to do that outside of a sterile environment um, in order to, again, reduce the potential of contamination. Um, Illuminex is actually an SLA printer, so unlike um, what you may think of a traditional 3D printer, it actually has a projector underneath that projects the image as it builds um, your 3D print layer by layer. Why I point this out is because over here to the right is we have what's called a BioX. This is a fusion deposition printer. This is the one that you're more likely familiar with. This is where the material is actually put through a needle adding pressure and actually put um, drawn layer by layer up from the bottom versus on this one. One of the advantages that the BioX gives us over the Luminex is the variety of different types of biomaterials. The Luminex is very, um, has a very small list of materials that works with, with SLA printing, whereas BioX has a huge variety of different types of materials, and we can actually play with them a lot better than I can with the SLA. One of the things we're actually developing on here is a, um, a different type of block for plants um, using cellulose, actually made here as a byproduct in Kansas. So it's kind of more of a renewable bioing that we're researching and we're really, really looking forward to using it. AJ, why don't you tell them about the computer that's behind me? Yeah, thank you, Heather. So over here, we have one of our workstations, and this is actually tied to the 3D printers that Heather just explained. So this workstation is to allow us to create different designs and such so that we can get an idea of how it's gonna look before we even print it. This computer also is connected to our microscopes and we can do some limited imaging, imaging processing as well. So let me show you one of our microscopes that we have here. This is the Revolve by Echo, Lab Echo Laboratories. This is a hybrid microscope. And what that means is it is both an inverted and an upright microscope. So I'll show you how that works. Right now, it's in its inverted configuration, which allows me to take different uh, cell culture vessels because the objectives are on the bottom and I can image them in this plate. It's the same as the cell site that we showed you earlier in the incubator. The objectives are on the bottom inside the box you saw and the culture vessels sit on top. Now, if I have something that is a little bit finer, say on a glass slide, I can turn this to an upright configuration. And the way I do that is I just take off the stage just like this, and literally, as its namesake, the revolve just literally revolves into an upright microscope. And so this is ideal because it allows us with one microscope to look at a variety of different samples in different formats. It's a very useful microscope and it has epifluorescent capabilities, which means we can do fluorescent work looking at proteins that are in our cells that we've tagged with different fluorescent markers. Now, let's move over to this piece of equipment that's next to it. This is the Molecular Devices ID3. This is a microplate reader, and this is important because we use this to get a lot of quantitative information on the different tests that we run. So, for example, we can grow cells in what's called a microplate, and we can look at the different substrates that those cells are actually producing or the biologics Heather mentioned earlier. This is similar to uh, what's done when, if you've ever had to take a drug test, you have a chemical reaction in a plate and they analyze it on a machine like this. This machine allows us to do tests where we're looking at fluorescent expression, luminescent expression, or different uh, spectra in the UV. So now I'm going to turn it over to Heather Thank you, AJ. We wish to tell everybody about a little bit of our last piece of equipment in here. This is the Image Express Micro by Molecular Devices, whereas the plate reader is kind of considered what we would call a high throughput device or high throughput imager because it's designed to image very, very quickly but not give you an extreme amount of data at one time. This particular guy is actually referred to as a high content imager, so he is designed to give you a lot of data in a short amount of time. So what's unique about him that allows us to take a series of images 
over an area and the particular the software will actually stitch it together for us so we can take a much bigger, higher magnification of a really really large piece of tissue or t block so for example under a normal microscope a tissue section we'd only be able this looks like this we'd only be able to view one little portion of it at a time which is really good when you're on the echo and you're doing some disciplinary scanning around but if you're wanting to actually be able to image the entire piece of tissue for publication purposes, that's where you need this guy. It's unable to load either piece of tissue or, for example, one of our T-blocks into this machine here. So a few parameters, hit a button, and it will automatically image the entire thing. If you want to look at the screen, you can actually see a picture of one of our T-blocks, which is this is the first machine that we've ever been able to image their entire T-block at a much higher magnification, which is very exciting because this allows us to do a different type of QA, QC that we've never been able to perform or do before. So now we have a little bit of footage of both the Image Express Micro and the Plate Reader in action so you guys can actually see how they work. <laughs> We hope you enjoyed uh, the videos on our Image Express Micro and Plate Reader functioning. Now we're going to show you our Phoenix lab. But first, um, AJ, why don't you tell us a little bit about this little prep lab we have over here? Yeah, so over here is another area we have to look at our cells in an R&D setting. Uh, maybe not quite as high resolution as in the other lab where we're doing things for publication or marketing purposes, but we just need to look at the cells quickly. So we, here we have a Nikon Eclipse uh, TS2R which is a great robust uh, fluorescent microscope where we can quickly look at cells. In addition to that, we have a nucleo vector over here, which we can actually do modifications and reprogram our cells to make designer cells based on what we're trying to accomplish for different clients' needs if they come to us asking for production of a protein or a specific cell line. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Heather and she'll take you over into Phoenix Lab. All right, welcome to Phoenix Lab. In here, we have our four labs 3D printers. These are more industrial size printers, and we use these to prototype vastly different types of culture vessels that we're uh, making in order to better grow cells in our tea blocks. The three printers here we actually got from a grant from the state of Kansas, which we are eternally grateful for. And each one has a different type of resin that has unique properties um, according to how we need it to function. So the one on the end here, actually has a particular resin that we can sterilize in any method, which is very good if we do need to make a culture vessel or any type of tools in order to manipulate our blocks. Again, we need to make sure that they stay sterile. The one in the center here has a resin that is very um, inert to all sorts of different types of solvents. So a lot of post-processing techniques use solvents that are not particularly friendly to plastics. Um, if you've ever had an occasion in lab where you put acetone on goggles, you found this out really quickly. Um, this, this particular type of resin is extremely resilient to that. This third one here is more of the um, kind of the practice uh, per, uh, resin. So it's the cheapest of the three. So we do a lot of our different molds and models in this one just to see if they print correctly. And you can see we actually have two printing live for you. And if you look really closely, you may be able to see um, a green laser going through it. The laser itself is actually not green, it's just for your protection um, in order to see it. It's a really fascinating process to watch these type of things work. So over here to the left, we have all of our post-processing equipment uh, for the prints once they're done. They'll go through a series of alcohol baths here and here to remove any of the excess resin. And then they'll go into this oven down here at the end. What's really kind of cool about this oven is not only does it heat it up to a particular temperature, but it'll actually shine UV light um, while the samples rotate, um, kind of like a rotisserie chicken. And this just allows the polymer to actually complete that polymerization process and become what it needs to be. So a lot of times um, after that process happens, as you can see here with these guys, they have these little supports 
um, and I'll need to kind of clean those off. And then once I do that, I'll actually put it through um, our little sonicator here, which will actually really super clean it before we then have to use it in any other post processing. AJ, why don't you go ahead and tell us what's behind you? So now we're going to give you a peek at one of our newest labs. This is going to be where our new genomics and proteomics lab is going to go here in the new future. So what does that mean in English? That basically means we're going to look at the expression of different genes and proteins of the cells when they're growing in our key blocks and figure out how they behave together and how that's helping different diseases. So this is going to be a very important lab in the future that allows us to gain more information at a quantitative level that we don't currently have the ability to gain. Right, so now we're going to take you over to Ecolab, but first, AJ, why don't you tell us a little bit about our central piece of equipment we have here? Sure, thanks Heather. So as we walk towards Eagle Lab, on my right and your left as you're doing the video, we have our fume hoods. And these are essential because we use these fume hoods to work with noxious chemicals when we're processing some of our different reagents. And so what we do is we actually will work with the chemicals under the hood so we're not breathing in any of the fumes. This is also important because we store our acids and bases underneath uh, our fume hoods as well to keep us all safe. And then here in our second fume hood, we have our ethylene oxide gas sterilizing unit. So we are often sterilizing our different um, accessories, our key blocks, et cetera. And some of the materials we work with cannot be sterilized by traditional methods such as steam sterilization in an autoclave. That's where this comes in handy and we can use um, ethylene oxide to render uh, all biological essences on the material completely inert. And that's what this is used for. As we move back this way, what you will see over here is our benchtop centrifuge, which we use this when we're working with different cells, when we need to basically transfer cells from one vessel to another. We can put them in a suspension, in a tube, pellet them down, so then after that they can be resuspended and transferred again. And then this is what's called a water bath, which is what we use to actually warm up reagents before we expose any of our cells to them. So now, Heather's going to tell us about what we have here behind me on this wall. What we have here is a series of fridges and freezers um, that we use for everyday work here in the lab. So the fridge over here on the right stores things at 4 degrees and is full of all the different types of medias and supplements that we need to grow all the various types of cells that we do, and as well as our inventory of cheap blocks, as well as all of our different bio The guy in the middle um, holds temperature at negative 30 degrees C. Um, this is where we keep a lot of our extra supplements. So supplements for, say, any of the media that's not being made up must be kept at 30 degrees um, in order to keep it fresh and all the protein working correctly. And also any type of um, samples that we do a lot of processing will also be stored in the negative 30. Now negative 80, again, this is actually holding things at negative 80 degrees C, which is quite cold. A lot of you may have heard about these in the news recently, uh, both the Pfizer and Moderna uh, CB19 vaccines must be kept at this particular temperature. Uh, it's very, very critical to keep proteins stored at this temperature long term. So if you never want to kind of get in and out um, of this type of freezer, that's why we have the negative 30. Um, because the negative 80 is kind of critical to keep at that temperature, we actually have a duplicate of it and both the negative 30 and the 4 degrees in our Eagle lab. Um, as well as a backup diesel generator for these guys. So if we ever lose power, that will automatically kick on. If for whatever reason the diesel generator runs out of fuel um, and the temperature starts to rise in this guy, uh, liquid CO2 canisters will actually dump in liquid CO2, helping to keep the temperature still down as critically and as low as possible until we can figure out a backup plan. So now we'll go ahead and take you over to Eagle Lab. Okay, now we're gonna take you into Eagle Lab. Eagle Lab is where we do a lot of our wet veg chemistry. So what that involves is a variety of different things. One that it can include material testing on all of our different bio weeds. It can also include the labeling of our cells that we put into our blocks so we can actually be able to see them. So over here we have our two different water purification systems. The one over here is designed to give us molecular grade water. So this is water that's about as pure as you can possibly get it. Um, we use this when we actually need to, say, look at different type of protein concentrations because we don't want any contamination from what might be in the water otherwise. 
and our, for any other type of water work, um, so making say solutions or anything of that nature, we use a, um, a reverse osmosis system that we have here. So on one of our benches, um, we're going to ha have a whole setup that AJ is actually going to talk to you about. Yeah, so over here we have our PCR setup. We use this basically to do a variety of different molecular analyses on different samples that we've created in Falcon Lab or uh, we're testing different cells with. And what you'll notice as you pan out and look at this lab here is that we actually have a total of six different islands. Each island is intended to be its own unique workstation. And Heather, why don't you tell the audience uh, what our future plans are with this lab? Sure thing, Amy. So like I mentioned, we, this is our white chemistry lab. And one of the things that we do here is doing material testing. We have all sorts of different materials that we need to get different types of tensile strengths and whatnot. So one of the scientists that we hope to employ in the future is one that is strictly um, to do all of the material testing, as well as a polymer chemist who will be synthesizing a lot of the different types of those types of bioleaks. But one of the things that we're currently uh, doing is our T blocks are made under research and development parameters, um, which is great for say universities and research labs, but due to that constraint, they can't be used in a clinical setting. So AJ, why don't you tell us what about our future plans for that? Yes, so fortunately, we've had a lot of demand from several of our collaborators to use our product in a clinical setting for clinical trials. But in order to do that, we need to be able to produce those products under what are called current good manufacturing practices. And that requires having a clean room and a few other parameters put in place that will allow us to do that. And so we're going to walk across the hall now and show you where our newest lab is going to be set up so that we'll have the ability to produce our T blocks under uh, standards approved by the FDA so that they are safe to use in a clinical trial. So here we are actually outside our future Hawk lab, which is where our future clean room slash GMP facility will be. Mm -hmm. And as you'll notice, there's not currently a door, but that's okay because thanks to video magic, we can just go in there right now. So this is the future site of our Hawk Lab. As you can see, it's pretty bare right now, but in the future, the floor is gonna be completely sealed. We're gonna have a completely seamless ceiling. The walls are gonna be painted. And what we plan to put in here is actually a modular clean room. This will be a place where we will be garbed in full uh, PPE and we will actually have dedicated personnel to manufacture our blocks under a quality management system. And what's great about this new space we're gonna take over is not only do we have this area, but if we need a bigger footprint for our clean room manufacturing, we have one more additional space to grow into. So as you come into here, we can actually expand our clean room in here for production based on our different needs, depending on whether or what the demand is. So Heather, obviously we're going to be doing a lot of building. Uh, I guess that means we're going to be hiring. Do you want to tell our audience about our plans for that? Yeah, sure. It's like I mentioned before, uh, we're going to be hiring additional scientists to do bench work, but we'll also actually need a whole group dedicated to the quality of control and quality assurance process that goes within making a product that is GMP ready. So we will need to devote this space to not only allow them to work, but we'll also need a whole set of offices and whatnot in order for them to actually be here. And we're not sure where that is now. So now that you got to see our new Hawk Lab space, we uh, have taken a detour back out into the hallway where we were before we entered. And now we're at the end of the hallway and we're going to show you where the new office space is going to be for those new employees we intend to hire. So in this ante room right here, what you'll notice is this is where we are going to hopefully have our future conference room so that we can meet with our collaborators uh, across the world. Heather, why don't you show them the next space over? And in here, we have a whole huge room devoted to future office space. One advantage of this is our current office space is just on the other side of this wall, so it's very easy for us to expand and make a huge office complex for every single person that we plan on hiring. So we are looking forward to hiring some very talented people in just the near future and look forward to setting them up here. With that, let's go back up front to uh, conclude the day. 
We hope you enjoyed the tour of Roanoke today, as well as looking at our future plans for expansion. We appreciate the time you took out of your busy schedule to spend this hour with AJ and I. And now if you have any follow-up questions, we would be happy to receive them. Thank you so much for your time today. Welcome back. We hope you enjoyed that virtual tour of Roanoke. AJ and Heather are gonna take a moment to set up for Q&A. While they do, let me quickly explain how the Q&A session will work here. Thank you for everyone that submitted questions using the widget at the bottom. I've been curating those questions during the video tour and you can continue to submit questions during the Q&A session as well. I'll be reading these questions to Heather and AJ and they'll respond for the entire audience. We'll do our absolute best to answer as many of the questions as possible. With that, AJ and Heather, if you're ready, we can go ahead and start the Q&A session. Yep, thank you, Matt. Yeah, yeah. So uh, our first question is, um, with this technology, how long can you extend primary cell cultures versus normal culture? So that has yet to be um, determined. So far, we have been able to take primary culture out to 60 days without having to do any subculturing which is pretty big. We have experiments going on uh, here to see if we can make it all the way to 180 days. Thank you, AJ. Uh, one of our other questions was, can you talk about the advantages of using the Luminex versus the BioX? And is it related to manufacturability? Yeah, so there are both advantages and disadvantages of using one versus the other. So the Luminex has a huge advantage of that it actually has a higher print resolution than the BioX. Um, it also allows you to expand how many you can print at one time because it is a projection based. So it really doesn't matter if you have one part or four parts, it'll actually take the same amount of time in order to print those parts. Whereas the BioX will actually have to print each part individually. The downside of the Luminex is while well, although it can print more and print faster. It really only has at this moment about two different inks that will work with the particular process that the projector uses in order to print. Whereas the BioX does have that huge variety of different types of inks. I can't even recall off the top of my head, I think it's somewhere between 20 and 30 different types of inks that it can use. Um, on the manufacturing side, so I would say definitely the Luminex is more for that because the BioX is, is definitely more R&D focused than the Luminex would be. One other thing is um, the BioX allows you to combine different biomaterials together or different bio -eaks, So that's another advantage for R&D. Uh, the other thing, just to clarify on the Luminex, while we can print multiple things together, we are limited to what the uh, print uh, platform space is. So it's whatever we can fit within that volume is our, the max of what we can print. Yeah. Thank you both. Um, we had a question that asked if you could elaborate on the uses for the cellulose T blocks. They're saying they can imagine they're quite expansive. Yeah, so at the moment, I can't really go too in depth on that because we are working with a, uh, a business um, that would prefer at the moment for them to kind of not be, not for us to reveal their name. Um, but one of the advantages is to kind of make a cheaper version of what they currently use uh, in their greenhouses. And it's for an advantage for us um, because AJ and I would like to actually try and use as many Kansas sources as possible. We're actually really proud from being from Kansas for the most mm -hmm. part. Um, and so this is kind of a win-win for us. Uh, the Actually the land, we get the cellulose. This is just a literal throwaway byproduct for them. So if you're able to repurpose it and recycle it into a reusable material for something else, this is kind of just like icing on the cake. So mm -hmm. we, we hope maybe within the next year or so, we'll actually be able to um, demonstrate some of that data, but at the moment we can't. Mm -hmm. Thank you again. <laughs> Hey, this next one's not a question, but a nice comment. They, they wanted to commend you on your use of rotisserie chicken in a lab tour. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know why it makes me think of rotisserie chicken. <laughs> <laughs> so we do have another question that asks, what sort of rare cell types have you been able to grow in t -box? Um, So far, some of the, the cell types that have been able to be successfully grown uh, in the T-blocks have been... Um, 
what are known as induced pluripotent stem cells or IPS cells, uh, different types of mesenchymal stem cells. Those are adult stem cells you find in the umbilical cord, uh, your fat tissue or the bone marrow. Um, we have a few collaborators that are still trying out some different neuronal lines uh, to see if they can get uh, primary neurons to grow. And we have a few other uh, cell lines we can't reveal yet, but what I can say is um, they are related to cancer research. Thank you, AJ. Mm -hmm. Our next question asks, with all this cell culture going on, how do you manage maintaining cell lines over the weekends? And with the increase in of production, how do you see cell production changing? Well, I can answer that first question. So luckily, um, AJ and I live both very close to the facility. I only live about 10 minutes up the road. So you can imagine if somebody can't make it in, it's, well, I'm always here. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I, it's kind of the little baby being the closest. That's not unusual for me. Um, I ran a core facility and things break, things got to get fixed. So, and you're here fixing them because you're the one that can fix them. What I will piggyback off that is we are developing a technology that will uh, semi-automate the culture to eliminate the need to come in on the weekend. So one of the beautiful things about the T-Blocks is uh, users no longer have to subculture and passage. So if it's just changing media, there are a variety of different systems that um, could potentially be adapted to say perfuse media through our blocks. The, uh, the media can flow uh, freely right now be, due to the size of the pores and the micro channels. And I think there was a second part to that question, Matt, that I might Yeah, have. it was asking about uh, what you see the future of cell production looking like. Well, what we see hopefully with our, our product is we're gonna make it more efficient. So um, our goal is to give power to a lot of basic science research labs and, and smaller companies that don't have the resources and the ability to grow large quantities of cells due to uh, equipment footprint, personnel, et cetera. And with our product, without having to buy that special equipment or hire additional people, they can grow uh, billions to potentially trillions of cells for their different experiments. And what that should do in turn is uh, accelerate the uh, uh, developmental pipeline for translational research is the ultimate goal. Thanks, AJ. Uh, another one of the questions that came in is asking if you could expand on your genomics and proteomics plans. Are we talking single cell resolution or bulk? It'll start as bulk, but our long our long term goal, um, maybe not in this next expansion, but the one after, is to go down to a single cell uh, resolution. That will be important with some of the other technologies we have planned in the future. Okay, there's another question about uh, your omics lab. In the lab where you're planning on working uh, with genomics genetics, are you planning on producing knockout tissues rather than whole knockout mice uh, to increase the speed of those types of tissue development studies? If not, what what is the plan for that? Kerry, can you tell us more? Um, what I can comment on that is, yes, we do plan to engineer uh, some knockout tissues. Our goal is actually to reduce the need for um, certain animal studies to make things more efficient. So that's about all I can comment on there. But yes, uh, that's, that's in the direction we would like to go. Okay, thank you. Um, a question related to the ethylene oxide. Um, have you come across any issues with trace amounts of ethylene oxide impacting cell growth in T-blocks? So just to, to clarify, um, right now, um, we mainly use the ethylene oxide to sterilize our accessories, but not the T-blocks themselves. Um, we actually outsource um, our sterilization for the T-blocks just because with the material we use, um, the, uh, the structure does not hold up. So um, that has not been a, a concern for us. So it's mostly to our, our plates, our tools and things like that are, are what are primarily sterilized with the ethylene oxide chamber. Thank you. I can follow up on the hydrogels themselves due to the nature of ethylene oxide sterilization uh, just wouldn't hold up through the entire process of ethylene oxide sterilization. Okay. 
Thank you both. We have a question here. It says, you talked about harvesting biologics as well as cells from the T-blocks. Can you talk any more about how biologics like exosome are harvested from T-blocks? Well, so right now we're kind of in the early development phase and right now we're just basically, it's the media that comes out of, that you rinse out of the block every day or every other day when you're doing your media changes. It's that can, it's also referred to as a kind of conditioned media. You take that media and that's what's actually um, taken to either spin down for your vesicles or anything else like that. We've did, at this point, we've kept it for um, analytical purposes. Um, we haven't so far gotten one together with our collaborators yet. Um, mainly due to the current situation um, on giving them a bunch of this stuff for them to actually start their own work with that condition media. But what, what I can comment, what's been exciting um, about the media we've been collecting is we have seen an increase in different secretions from cells that is dramatic uh, compared to cells that are grown say on a 2D uh, surface. And when, when cell numbers are normalized, we're seeing anywhere depending on the particular biologic um, from a two to a uh, 11 fold increase in um, the amount of um, the component being secreted from the cells when they're grown in a T-walk versus on 2D. Thank you. We had a question that asked, with your T-block technology, what characterization have you done with gold or lipid nanoparticles? I'm curious how easy it would be to study translational technology in a 3D matrix such as yours. Um, actually, one thing I've been talking about with uh, AJ's uh, students, actually, a lot. There's a company that actually combines both a a uh, gold nanoparticle and a fluorophore, because um, what we are actually, I don't really want to get too much into, but there's a different imaging technique that we um, are planning on using in conjunction with fluorescence, and then we think the gold will actually help us with that. I'm um, hoping in the next couple months we're trying to secure a spot in that other imager in order to attempt this out. So uh, if the individual who um, asked that question, if you could um, send me along their contact information, I can talk to them more offline about that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, mechanical testing has been mentioned. What kinds of mechanical testing need to be done in a T-block? And would that be more of a quality assurance measure for each batch? Or is this, uh, or is general testing done to know the capabilities of the block? Um, great question. So right now it's general testing, uh, DMA, Instron, et cetera, to get the basic uh, parameters of the, the T-block, which, um, I don't have on me at the moment, but with the R&D that we are doing, the goal is as we tailor the blocks with different blends of materials, um, that would become part of the quality assurance to make sure that, let's say, if we are um, planning to grow cartilage cells in a block, that the mechanical uh, features that are required for what allow cartilage cells to grow well um, would be met during uh, the quality assurance phase. So that's part of our, our, um, our development yeah, plan. Yeah, to kind of go on that, to like if you're unsure, say you have a particular type of cell line that doesn't seem to really fit in it anywhere, is that we can then offer these particular measurements for you so that you can kind of make a best guess estimate based on your cells and ones that you would like to try. Thank you again. One of the questions says, hey, there's a lot of startups that uh, allow people to grow different cell types together and image those interactions. How does your tech compare? For instance, how easy and scalable is imaging of interacting cell types? So, so far, I will admit the imaging is a little bit of a challenge. Um, as you can imagine, imaging in 3D in and of itself is a challenge. Um, the block itself, while it looks very, um, very clear, it actually does have enough diffraction or basically um, kind of moves the light into different directions that it makes difficult, it makes imaging with uh, yeah, past a couple hundred microns or basically a couple widths of a human hair a little difficult. Um, I'm actually, we're working with molecular devices, the folks who make the micro on trying to make a little bit better ways uh, to image that and see what kind of components that they have to hopefully we can come together with a new kind of design if necessary or just, you know, kind of a ticks, trips and tips and tricks on how to actually image it. So far, um, 
I've got a different type of um, kind of imaging vessel, really. It makes it easier to image the top and the bottom of the block without having to manipulate that. Um, that's thanks to our lovely intern, Tristan, who was here. So we're, we're constantly working on that. That's what the what really helps with some of the form labs printers is that we can get these ideas, we can print them, functionalize them, see how they work, make little tweaks and, and make them a little bit better. Um, we're hoping eventually within the next year or so that we'll actually upgrade our unit to a confocal so we'll get a little bit better. Um, other than that, other than this other imaging thing with the gold nanoparticles, um, that's the only other thing that I kind of have going on at that at the moment. I think, was there a follow up? There was a secondary part of that question. Well, no, I think there's a couple other questions in here that are somewhat related. There, I think if I'm going to ad lib a couple of them together, it's how do you monitor cell growth in these? Is it destructive? And uh, maybe talk about the, the relative pros and cons versus other 2D cell culture methods. Yeah, so the, the primary way to monitor cells at this point in time with current technologies really relies on um, really uh, fixing the, the samples, the T-blocks in place and doing some type of either histological or immunohistochemical stain um, so that we can fluorescently label uh, the cells, and that's where we're able to get our best images of the cells in the blocks. So you can think of it as really treating the blocks as if it was an actual piece of tissue, which is part of the reason why it's called a tissue block. Um, but with fluorescent labeling, that tends to be uh, the most convenient way to look at cells uh, within the block. Um, we have found that doing uh, cryosectioning seems to work the best right now just uh, because uh, uh, procedures like using paraffin embedding um, tend to degrade the block. So um, it's something we are still working on. Uh, we have not done any kind of like focused ion beam imaging or anything like this or anything like that. Thanks, AJ. We have um, another question here. I think it's asking really about sort of the current state and future state of, of how t-blocks could be used with t-blocks i mean they're asking essentially can we start creating things like cartilage for knees or even tissues in the spinal column that is a that's a very long-term goal but in the in the short term what we're trying to do is make a uh, a platform in which it is easier to grow cells in 3d to not make organoids which is very popular right now but to make an expanded tissue or cell culture cells together to make a, a little bit more of a bigger than an organoid so that we have something that does resemble more of a, a functional tissue. But uh, down the road, our hope is with refinement of this technology is that it could provide insights to making actual cartilage tissue that potentially could become some type of graft. Okay, I think we have time for one more quick question. Uh, they're asking, are cells cultured in a dynamic environment like a bioreactor? What systems are, are featured in terms of forces, flow, CO2 levels, things like that? So right now, the, in what we do for most of our R&D is static culture. However, um, the T-blocks are set up that they could be put into uh, a system that has some flow to it. We are working with some collaborators on that, and we do have aspirations of um, using some bioreactor technologies just to make them more physiologically relevant. Um, but currently most of our RD is with, with static culture, but we have made it so that there is the potential that they could be adapted to be used in um, a dynamic culturing environment. Thank you. With that, I think it's time for us to conclude our virtual event this evening. We really wanna thank all of you for coming and participating. We hope you enjoyed your virtual visit to Ronak and meeting the Ronak founders. You can expect to receive a follow-up survey from us in the near future. And if you'd like to contact us, you'll be provided with an opportunity to get in touch with us there. Thank you for your time. We hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night.